My name is Crystal Herbranson, and I call sunny Southern California home. I started working with WordPress about seven years ago, and in the last two years was introduced to the world of WordCamps through my job at Safari. Um, I'd like to start with a short little story to kind of, one, get everyone at ease and also let my heart stop racing. So it was about two years ago that my husband was out actually going to speak at a word camp. And so he was out of town. It was myself and my son at home. And at about 1 o'clock in the morning, a couple motion sensors on the house went off. And I, the dog started barking. Life as I knew it was now awake. And I was up. And so I started looking, turn on all the lights, making sure, you know, who's out there? Is it our little happy family of possums that loves to walk around? Like, who is it that's out there? Uh, and so after 15 minutes, couldn't see anything, didn't know what was going on, decided let's turn the lights back down, let's go to bed, and figure it out in the morning. So I woke up in the morning, went outside, the gate to our backyard was open, which made me know, probably not the possums that opened that back gate, but rather a person or someone, but something that was able to open that back gate. And so it was at that time that we decided to kind of put some security in place for our home. So we had the motion sensors, this was alerting us to different things, but then we decided to also upgrade and put some cameras on the house, which kind of, you know, looks a little odd for some, but when you work in security, you start to think about these things, and then it allows for us to have remote access to those types of things. So we kind of experienced the same situation when it comes to website security. We typically don't act until something happens to us. And so we're going to talk about the frustrations with website security and what we've learned over the years at Sakuri cleaning and protecting websites every day. I get to work with a great group of people whose passion is website security. And each day we work with a wide range of customers whose knowledge and expectations for security differ greatly. Through our conversations, we aim to educate and understand the needs of each and every person that's coming to us. And it's typically at a time when frustrations are high that it's our job to make a complex situation simple. Today, we're going to walk the path together to understanding WordPress security and establishing a set of principles that you can take when thinking about your website. We'll cover a good amount of information, so don't worry about writing it all down. Just sit back and listen. The slides, I have them available. There's a link on this slide right here if you want to take a photo. As well, on each and every slide, or nearly every slide, you'll see a reference link so that you can have a go-to resource when you get home. What I hope is that at the end of the talk, you'll walk away with some new insights into, one, how you can create a security versus posture for your website. So I know, it's convoluted, it's like a big mouthful. But what that means is just being aware of what it takes to be online and to be secure. You'll also get to understand hosting and its role in security. We'll differentiate the security firewalls. We'll also dispel the myth of why would anyone hack me? And we'll get an understanding of how websites get hacked. We'll finish it up with some WordPress specific security essentials, tools, and resources. So, well, let's jump into it. One, I think it's important to really fully appreciate the numbers as the popularity of WordPress makes it an attractive target for hackers. With 26% of all websites online and 59% of all CMSs running on WordPress, a successful exploit means a huge financial gain for these attackers. These people seek to take away your visitors, your SEO rankings, and your site resources regardless, regardless of the size of your website. So, the security issue isn't with the core WordPress application. Let's be clear. It's not core WordPress. This is being checked continually by a set of contributors, but it's the plugins and the themes that don't undergo the same rigorous process they have to worry about and you have to think about. What that results in is a lot of WordPress-specific code out there ready to be exploited and ultimately, a ton of websites available to be attacked. So, how many of you guys are updated to the current version, 4.0 or greater? Awesome. 
we've made some advances in the community, and we should be very proud to the fact that there is 87% of the websites online running WordPress that are updated to this. We can't say the same about other CMSs, so it's a nice effort and a nice move forward in the direction of security in terms of our core application. All right, hosting. <laughs> it's important to clearly understand the extent for which your host is responsible and the responsibilities that lie with you as the website owner. So let's be clear. The host takes care of certain things and you as a website owner need to take care of some other things. So I can't tell you how often I hear people say, but I thought my host was taking care of that for me and now they've taken me offline. This can be frustrating to say the least because they once thought that the host was protecting them. And yes, hosts provide security measures that protect their networks and their servers. We'll talk about what that typically encompasses when we differentiate security firewalls. But first, let's begin by defining hosting and the environments. We can simplify them down to three core options, shared, virtual private, and dedicated servers. Starting with shared, because it's the most popular and likely how many of us are on shared hosting. A decent amount. So we get the benefit of cost savings. It's also simple. It's easy to get up and running online in a shared environment. With these environments, what you're experiencing is that there's multiple sites sharing the resources of one server. And the natural next step would be a virtual private or VPS solution. With this, it's a single server that's partitioned into multiple virtual servers. So what you experience is a protected amount of CPU, RAM, processing power that's dedicated to your particular instance. Now, with a virtual private, you can also have a number of sites hosted within there. Same thing, when companies start growing and when individuals start running either complex databases, CPU intensive applications, as well as just high traffic websites or potentially a very likely targeted website, so the political sites, some of our churches, those types of things likely move to a dedicated option. With a dedicated option, you're experiencing the full breadth of what a actual server can provide you. Having a dedicated server obviously provides you the ability to store multiple sites there. And it's pretty costly, which is why not a lot of people go with it. And it also provides a full range of different controls and aspects that you can have in terms of hosting. But the big takeaway here is that regardless of the money that you're forking out for your hosting, you have to think about one thing and one thing only is how are you storing your sites? Do you have isolation in process? So the environment that you have can run the potential for cross-site contamination. And we recommend, as stated right here, isolating site groups so that this will help mitigate your risk of potential infections across all sites, your dev sites, your production sites, your family website, a bunch of other customers that you may have hosted in that same account because it's easy to log in. On to differentiating firewalls. It's a mouthful in itself to try and say. <laughs> now let's try and understand it with the terminology being used across multiple different industries. Firewalls, we hear it so often, but it's sometimes complicated. And at Sakuri, we see the frustration and confusion that some customers experience when they're trying to understand what is the difference in a firewall and what does that mean to my website. Network, local, and application firewalls often get mixed around. I'm going to break it down for you so that you can have a good understanding of what you get from each of those so that you can better understand what it means for your site when you hear, I have a firewall. Network firewalls are often what you think of when dealing with routers and servers, and in many cases, these are provided via software or hardware. For example, a firewall sitting at the perimeter of a network that sits in front of the web servers, 
by design, needs to allow for ports 80 and 443. So that's your HTTP, your HTTPS traffic. What that means is, when thinking about your website, your host will likely say that they have deployed some specific firewalls within their environment. And these firewalls are meant to keep you safe. But remember, this is likely a network firewall. The problem, however, is that by default, they have to allow web traffic through, which provides you the potential for attacks that will come from your visitors. So that's what network firewalls do. They're protecting an actual perimeter for a company, or your hosts, rather. Now, with local firewalls, we're working towards the same goal of protecting a trusted zone. But in this instance, we're going to focus on a specific environment, such as the server or a desktop. When working with your hosts, your access to these local firewalls will differ depending upon your hosting environment. So do you have a shared environment, a VPS, or a dedicated? Most hosts, though, regardless of your configuration, should be leveraging both network and local firewalls across their entire infrastructure. So that's something to think about when you talk to your hosts. Make sure and ask those questions. What types of firewalls do you have? Are they at the local and network level? Their network firewalls protect the perimeter, and the local firewalls are protecting the assets that are within that, that perimeter. And you should note that similar to network firewalls, local firewalls have little to do with your website's security. Got that little to do with your website security. And so, we reach application firewalls. And here's where we start to really talk about your website and how firewalls can protect them. Application firewalls can be deployed in hybrid methods. You can find them at the local or network level, depending upon your desired configuration. The question you should be asking your hosts is how do they handle specific threats to their website? So what are they doing to protect themselves? Some hosts deploy application firewalls, some have built-in house firewalls, and others leverage open source technologies like mod security. What does this mean for you and what should you know? You should know that it's not enough anymore to deploy network and local firewalls. While they can account for some web traffic, they are very ineffective when it comes to focusing on web-specific traffic. And with the evolution of website-based attacks, it's a necessity for you to have an added layer of protection that allows access to your site. And as I mentioned, the most common misconception that we hear is that this is the type of protection that owners expect from their web so website hosts. And really, honestly, that's just unfair. Hosts have one focus, one focus only, and that's to ensure that your site is accessible. It has nothing to do with the security that's put in place. Security, however, is an industry in and of itself where development and research work together on a daily basis so that they can stay up on the threat landscape, which is ever-changing. And speaking of misconceptions, I'm sure you've thought it, I'm sure some of you are thinking it right now, but why would anyone hack me? I have a small blog, it's just my family's pictures, it doesn't matter, nobody comes to my website, I'm not big enough. It's time to dispel that myth and start to talk about what it means to motivate hackers. Here's that number. There are one billion websites online. This makes for a very nice playground for hackers. First, the number of attacks online affecting the CMS world are highly automated. Automation allows for mass infections, decreased resources on the part of the hackers, and many times this can be accomplished with a set of small online tools. This opens the door to a whole new breed of hackers. So there's two key areas of attacks, those that are targeted and those that are an attack of opportunity. Targeted attacks are the ones that we typically hear about on the news, the LinkedIn, the Facebook, the Twitter, those ones that get great big publicity. 
And in these cases, many times what they're experiencing is a denial of service or a DOS tag. And so this is geared at taking the website down. The resources spent on targeted attacks is much higher than what you would expect from an automated attack. And this is because when the, when the attack that they're going after or the organization that they're going after is larger, the benefits are larger when they're able to gain access to that site. So the payoff is bigger. They can penetrate it, they can access different information, they can leak out Sony's new you know, email sources on who they want to have in their next movie. And so the list, the list of some of the, the knowns for target attacks are as follows. This is really 0.001% of the attacks that happen online. This is a specific target. So they're going after Mark Zuckerberg in particular. Um, and these attacks often are unknown. What they're looking for is a hole. They're looking for a way to get in. This is not an exploit that they found online, but rather they're actually checking and trying to find a way. This is a huge amount of resources that are spent in this area. But what we see most often is those of opportunity. And what that means for you is that it's not an individual going after your website, but rather it's something that's happened when a botnet crawled the web and your website won the unlucky lottery of an attack and a compromise. So it could have been that outdated plugin, the theme you're running, or a core update you just forgot to do. And so let's take a look at what automation is. It's 99% of the time the attacks that we're seeing. And this is a specific target. So there's websites like Exploit TV where you can go down and check any different exploit, and anybody online can really become the next great hacker. So that's something to think about. From our data, what we have found is that it takes about 30 to 45 days for a site with no content and no audience to be crawled and added to a botnet. Once added, the attacks start immediately without really any rhyme or reason. And that's why automation allows for widespread infections, high efficiency, and a new class of hackers that are growing global botnets. When we think about the motivations, we think about why, why is this happening? Why are there people online doing this? We can categorize hacker motivations into four key areas. It's the money, it's your audience and your site resources as well as the ones that just do it because they can. The kids that are at home trying to check out, hey, can I do this? This might be fun. Uh, and so, let's check out the prime motivator. It's revenue, it's the money, it's the black hat SEO, it's the drive-by downloads or data stealing. It's a serious business making billions of dollars. Billions. And so, pennies off every single redirected link off of the countless individuals that are online that source the web. Spam has turned into a money-making machine. And it seemingly is going to go on and on and on and on, no matter what we really do about it. So, you've worked hard to build your web presence, and hackers, um, sure, are going to thank you, because it's that audience that they need in order to collect those pennies for the Viagra ads, the Cialis, the Louis Vuitton, all of those things that you can think of. So your audience is very important. It's not only important to you, but it's important to the hackers that are out there. Now the resources. You pay for your hosting, and so the hackers think that it's nice to piggyback off of what you're doing. And there's also the use of your resources, which cuts down on the overhead for them, as well as speeds up the process for these botnet crawlers. These guys, the guys that are just at home, the kids often that simply found a cool website that has some exploits and they really want to get into computers and it's a hot, crazy, sexy thing to do. These are the ones that just, they're just doing it because they can. And a lot of times this is also the people that are going for hacktivism. You'll hear that word, hacktivism. So it could be that they want to take over a church website um, and have different you know, logos posted onto the front page. They do this really as, as, as a badge of honor, that they could, that they did it, that, that their mark is left on, on the web, and, and then somebody has to come around and figure out how to clean it up while they're frantically searching for the options. 
So, we've talked a lot about what motivates people. Let's drive in, dive into the threats that contribute to why websites get hacked. We can drill this down to four key areas. Access control, software vulnerabilities, cross-site contamination, and third-party integrations and hosting. You'll likely hear some analogies thrown around if you've ever heard somebody try and capture the importance of the concept of access controls. You might hear it likened to locking the front door of your house, but leaving all the windows open. Um, and so brute force attacks are what we most often see impacting access control. This is where automation is used to guess the usernames and passwords of your accounts. With databases of usernames and passwords on the internet, this makes for an easy way to automate. There are databases with millions and millions of potential usernames and passwords to try, and all they have to do is run a script and it starts its work. Phishing attacks are also used to try and capture the logins, as well as cross-site scripting to intercept the credentials via the browser. The most common is a man-in-the-middle attack where insecure networks are used as a means to transfer plain text data. Plain text data, that's your what you've just entered to log into your WP admin, they're going to see it, it's going to go straight over to the hackers, and they're going to then be able to gain access to your site. What you have to do is you have to think beyond your website. You have to think of how do you log into your WP admin? How do you log into your server? How do you log into your hosting account? How do you log into your computer? What types of things do you have in place to protect yourself from your actual hardware standpoint? Software vulnerabilities are something that we really can't keep up with. Anywhere that there's a system, starting with the web server to the browser, there's potential for a vulnerability to exist. And when it comes to websites in particular, software vulnerabilities are exploited through URL injections typically. Cross-site contamination. This is a big one. This is something that I hope that everyone understands when we stop today. Is that what we see is this happens when an attacker is able to run an exploit through a vulnerability on one website and then gain access to that entire server through that actual one site that was infected. So this can happen in shared environments. This can happen in virtual private. Technically, it can happen in a dedicated if you have multiple sites stored there and they were able to get in through one website. But this is the huge one. This is something that you really have to think about is that many times this is the culprit of reinfections and where isolation and permission controls need to be had. Because without it, you run the risk of infecting everything and that's a lot of time and resources. Third party integrations and services are something that many of us use to build and maintain our websites. A couple of examples are CDNs and ad networks. This slide focuses prim primarily on malvertising. So this is where an ad network is used to distribute malware across the web. The thing and the problem with this is, is that it's not localized to your actual server. These are the web instances which are very hard to replicate when trying to check. And your site can then be taken offline and really your only option is to remove those ad networks. Hosting. So we talked about hosting in the beginning, but there's something that we need to remember and that's that there are those companies out there that want to do it all. They want to do your marketing, they want to do your SEO, they want to manage your website, they want to develop it, they hope that you call them every day because they need your money. And well, hey, and we're also going to host for you. But this is where the problem lies is that there are actual companies that are just dedicated to hosting and there's a lot that goes into hosting. And so it's these instances that can cause you some problems is when you hand over the keys to your website to a company that wants to do it all, but they don't actually have all the necessary tools, those local and network firewalls in place to ensure that your hosting environment is actually secure. So here's some of the types of infections that, that you're likely going to run into. And so that's malware, malware distribution, phishing, um, search engine poisoning, spam email, defacements, that's the hacktivism, DDoS attacks, botnets, and ransomware. Ransomware is huge now. We hear it about hospitals, um, some schools have also experienced it, so it's something that you really have to, have to think about is that you need a backup. The only way 
to circumvent a ransomware attack is through a backup. You have to have that available to you. And you need to ensure that your backups are not stored on your same server. This has to be in a separate location where it can't be touched. If you need to have it localized to your computer, do that. Whatever you need to do, have a backup. Backups are your friend. Here's a nice list that I think can go over a decent amount of the types of attacks we see and the motivations that, that prompt them. So some to, to note are the phishing. So phishing, this is the email, the social engineering. Um, these are done for revenue. And what you'll see on the side is that a decent amount of these are had because of revenue and your audience. I want to make it clear, this is a money-making business. People are building their life off of malware and the distribution of malware. So when thinking about website security, we've covered the role of hosting and security, what network and local firewalls do for you, and why your site is a target, regardless of the size of your site. We need to start thinking about what does it mean to be secure and what are the potential impacts of not taking steps to reduce your risk. Impacts to a compromise, this can be to your business and to the local level. Your brand is important, your brand reputation is important, and so with that, and a compromise can affect you. Luckily, people are kind of aware of this stuff happening, so you can rebound from this. But ultimately, if somebody has lost trust in your brand and your inability to secure yourself, they likely will go to a competitor. The economic impacts, this can be very costly. One, you can lose revenue if your site's blacklisted. Two, you can use, lose revenue just because people aren't coming to your site. You can also be taken offline. And then there's the cost that it takes to clean this up in case you're not able to do it. Here's the big one is that we see so many people that are upset, frustrated, anxious. They don't understand what's happened. And so it's, it's our job as security professionals to try and educate so that you don't have to experience any of these. On the technical side, a website blacklisting can be detrimental. One, some people don't even know how you, how you get that red box to go away. But some things to note is that this can lead to your site being blacklisted across, across global networks. So not just the search engines, but also the hardware aspects. SEO can be devastated. Your site can go from ranking on the first page to, to nowhere to be found in, in a quick instance. And so staying ahead of this, being able to have continuous monitoring in place for your site can help you circumvent that. Your visitors can also be compromised. They can then distribute malware across their computers and then in turn it just breeds itself for a continual perpetual circle of infections online. So, Technology will never replace your responsibility as a website owner. There's no 100% in security, and the goal is to be educated and informed in order to reduce your risks. Here are some of the tips that we have at Sakuri. You need to think about this as a defense in depth principle. You need to have multiple layers. If one fails, you need to have a backup in place. You need to leverage best practices of least privilege. Not everybody needs to be an administrator for everything. You need to place emphasis on the people who have access to your site. Use things like multi-factor, two-factor, password managers like LastPass. Do whatever you can to ensure that you're not using the same password across multiple vectors. Protect yourself against the exploitation of software vulnerabilities. And honestly, this can only be done with a web application firewall. You have to be able to stay ahead of the known and unknown attacks. And backups, as we stated, are your friends. You need to have them. Register your site with the search engines because this will allow you to have them also alert you to changes in your website. Here's some tools to mitigate your online risk. I know that not everybody wants to pay for security, but there are certain plugins, and you can get plugin fatigue for sure. Uh, InfoSec, a nice website that's dedicated to kind of reviewing some of the plugins that exist out there, they list um, top seven, I believe, of WordPress plugins that can help. Uh, PC Magazine, they, they focus on some password managers. Password managers should be something we all use. And um, WP Beginner goes through some pros and cons of backups so that you can really understand what goes into backups. And um, we focus on our website, our Sakuri blog, on a lot of just kind of tutorials. So the, the first one will go over how, how a WordPress website was hacked. It'll kind of dissect what that looks like for you. 
And for you kind of more advanced users, WPSCAN is a great tool that you can use to run some testing to see if anything that you have on your website is vulnerable. And WP, uh, CLI, we have a series that's dedicated to how you can securely manage your website. Last but not least, uh, here's some resources, so some go-to places is that WordPress themselves have some, has a nice page that's dedicated to security to help give you some tips on how to stay ahead of that. And hardening your website, that also is listed on, on the WordPress repository as well as in a couple of different areas. And we at Sakuri have a blog that's dedicated to defining the common website technologies and terminologies and also understanding the plugin ecosystem. It's huge. You search security in the repository, there's thousands of options, and that can get overwhelming. And then um, understanding the plugin vulnerabilities. So plugins are really kind of the big thing that, that you should really focus on and, and understand. You need to check it. If you're going to install it, you need to know when was the last time that it was updated, how long ago was it updated, is this maintained? If it's not maintained, don't put it on your site. All right? That's it. I think I... I'm on, right? <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Um, so, our, our scribe here needs this mic to be used in order for her to be able to okay. sure. type it. So I'm going to just pass this around. If you have a question, raise your hand. I know there's companies such as yours and others that are doing this, but is the government also doing things to try to keep that, or is it more just to protect government websites? You know, there are all these databases that are floating out there. Is there any group going in trying to, like, knock them out so that this doesn't happen? Yeah, so um, there's been a lot of news around um, information security as well as just the website as a whole, and it's kind of making its way to, to Congress. and you know, keeping net neutrality, all these different things. In terms of the government's protection of the web, I don't see that happening anytime soon. I believe that a lot of website owners kind of want to keep the government out of it. Um, but in terms of those databases, you know, it's a, um, there's, there's the tour, there's different underground websites that are dedicated to keeping this stuff online, and it's really going to be very difficult even for a government agency to try and go after them. Um, and, and a lot of times people come to us and they want to know, but how did they do it? After an attack has happened, it's often, if you don't have logs in place, it's very hard to kind of understand <coughs> where that comes from. But in terms of your question on, on the government getting involved, I don't foresee it happening, to be honest. Thank you. You had talked about the need for a website backup. Could you explain a little more about that, what it is, where to get one? Yeah, so... Um, there's, there are plugins that are dedicated to backups. There are third-party services. So a backup is, a com is basically a carbon copy of your website. And so that's all the files, down to your database, the whole nine. It's, it's, a, it's a duplication of your website. So it's hosted within your hosting panel, but maybe you also have it um, stored on your website. And so backups can be really purchased for as low as like five bucks a month through a lot of different organizations out there. I do just, your, your host does create backups, but something to note is that those backups can become infected as well. And so then when you turn on, when you re-upload that backup, you're now in the same situation, kind of, okay, now I've got to find the hack, now I have to, and some of these are, are like mobile, mobile, specific infection so you won't see them reoccur very quickly. So a backup is, is like I said, just a complete copy of your website. Store it somewhere other than where you have your website. Um, I mean, pouring it all the way offline is really kind of the best way to do it. Uh, have it somewhere on a, on a hard drive. I have a question about uh, XML RPC. Uh, if there's anything you could <laughs> say about... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, XML RPC, I've noticed that it seems there's a lot of vulnerability to that, or a lot of attacks try and come through that. Um, so I'm wondering if you could just talk for a moment about what you know about that. Uh, you know, okay, so remote executable, that's what you're referring to. These things can happen, um, typically they're happening because of a, of a software vulnerability. So 
these infections and these things happen by manipulating the URL for your site. They're able to add code at the end of, so if it said, you know, myawesomewebsite.com slash ampersign PHP blah blah blah, they're able to stuff their code into your URL and if if your site has a has a vulnerability, it can then accept that code and then run itself rampant across your website. We can talk offline about all the cool stuff that has to do with that. But yeah, typically, I mean, what we're seeing is that this stuff happens through your URL. So it's just really just stuffing code within there and seeing what it's able to pull back out and then gain access to your site. Any other questions? You can either use this or you can walk up to the mic there. Is there a difference in terms of security using a cloud-based uh, hosting service? Um, so, with security, I, w I would say no. Um, I'm, I, I don't work in the hosting spectrum, so I, I wouldn't be able to speak to how they have things set up. But typically, most hosts, regardless of if they're a, a cloud-based host um, or not, is that they, they will have different security elements in place unlikely that they're deploying any sort of application layer firewalls. That's just not something that a lot of website hosts do just by, by default. It's something that really is, is on the onus of the website owner to think about that layer of actual protection. They're worried about their infrastructure. Even if it's cloud race, they still have infrastructure that they have to protect, and they're protecting those networks and those servers. And, and like I said, it, it really is on us as website owners to think about that layer of protection of how do we protect our visitors and how do we protect ourselves with that that application. And that's what you that's what web web traffic is. That's the application layer. Yeah. 